continue to read the book by Ray Dalio, Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed and Fail. Now, Chapter Six. After reading Chapter Five, although the cycles、uh, pattern is、uh, as expected, not much new. However, it's good to see the details. There's still something I feel quite interesting, so I just feel that I want to read another chapter now. Chapter six: the big cycle of、uh, external order and disorder.、Um, relationships between people and the orders that、uh, govern them work in basically the same ways. Whether they are internal or external, and they blend together. The six-stage cycle of going between order and disorder that I described in the last chapter about what happens within countries works the same way between countries, with one big exception: international relations are driven much more by raw power dynamics. This is because all governance systems requires effective and agreed upon. Number one, laws and lawmaking abilities. Number two, law enforcement capabilities, for example, police. Three, ways of、uh, adjudicating, adjudicating, or what is the meaning? For example, judges. And four, clear and specified consequences that both suit crimes and are enforced. For example, fines and、uh, incarcerations, and those things either don't exist or are not as effective in guiding relations between countries as they are in guiding relations within them. Okay, that makes sense. But、uh, what do those things mean? We need to look further. When individual countries have、uh, more power than the collective、uh, of、uh, countries, the more powerful individual countries rule. For example, if the U.S., China, or other countries have、uh, more power than the United Nations, then the U.S., China, and the other countries will determine. How things go, rather than the United Nations. That is because the power prevails, and the wealth and the power among equals is rarely given up without a fight. The international order follows the law of the jungle much more than it follows international law. There are five major kinds of fights between countries: trade, economic wars, technology wars. Capital wars, geopolitical wars, and military wars. Number one, trade economic wars, conflicts over tariffs, import export restrictions, next and so on. Second, technology wars, conflicts over which technologies are shared, and so on. Geopolitical wars, capital wars. Capital wars, conflicts imposed through financial tools such as sanctions. Number five, military wars. While most of these type of wars don't involve shooting and killing, they all are power struggles. These struggles and wars, whether or not they involve shooting and killing, are exertions of power of one side over the other. They can be all out or contained, depending on how important the issue is and what the relative powers of the opponents are. But once a military war begins, all four of the other dimensions will be weaponized to the greatest extent possible. As discussed in the last several chapters, all of the factors that drive Internal and external cycles tend to improve and worsen together. When things get bad, there are more things to argue over. 
which leads to greater inclinations to fight. That's human nature. And it is why we have the big cycles, which oscillates between good times and bad times. All after wars typically occur when existential issues, ones that uh, are so essential to the country's existence that people are willing to fight and die for them, are at stake and they cannot be resolved by peaceful means. The wars that result from them make it clear which side gets its way and has a supremacy in subsequent matters. So a comment here, uh, what uh, situations at this time requires uh, wars? Do Russia really want to fight uh, Ukraine, to invade U Ukraine? Uh, do we have uh, here something uh, about a certain country's exi existence? Maybe because uh, NATO wants to uh, expand to the border of uh, Russia, so Russia feels uh, there is a uh, pressure ex uh, of existence. But um, yeah, there's a little bit. And also in Asia, is there any existential exist existence issues that uh, requires a wars? It's hard to say. There were three big cycles of a rising and a declining conflict, averaging about 150 years each. Though big civil and uh, external wars last only a short time, <coughs> they are typically the combination of the long-standing conflicts that led up to them. Each cycle consisted of a relatively long period of peace and prosperity. For example, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution that, saw, that sowed the seeds for terrible and violent external wars. For example, the Thirty Years' War, the Napoleonic, the Na Napoleonic, wars and the two world wars. The two things about war that one can be most confident in are number one that it won't go as planned and two that it will be far worse than imagined. The timeless and the universal forces that uh, produce changes to the external order Domestic and military strengths go hand in hand. The financial strength to outspend one's rivals is one of the most important strengths a country can have. The greatest risk of a military war is when both parties have number one military powers that are roughly comparable and two irreconcilable and existential differences. The choice that opposing countries face, either fighting or backing down, is very hard to make. Both are, are costly, fighting in terms of lives and money. And backing down in terms of the loss of status since it shows weakness, which leads to reduced support. To get more win-win outcomes, one needs to negotiate with a consideration given to what is most important to the other party and to oneself, and know how to treat them. Winning means uh, getting the things that are most important without losing the things that are most important. So wars that cost much more in lives and money than they provide in benefits are stupid. By and large, 
the tendency to move between win-win situation and the lose-lose relationships happens in a cyclical way. People and empires are more likely to have a cooperative relationships during good times and to fight during bad times. While I don't know about the love part of what they saying, always fair in love and war, I know the war part is right. As an example, in the American Revolutionary War, when the British lined up in rows for the fight, and the American revolutionaries shot at them from behind trees, the British thought that was unfair and complained. The revolutionaries weren't believing the British were foolish and that the cause of independence and freedom justifies changing the rules of war. That's just how it is. This leads me to one final principle. Have power, respect power, and use its power wisely. And uh, here, uh, it talks about military wars. In 1935, Hitler began to build the military. The German economy needed more resources to fuel itself, and it intended to use its military power to seize them. Japan was also hit exceptionally hard by the Depression and became more autocratic in response. In 1931, Japan went bro broke. That is, it was forced to draw down its gold reserves, abandon the gold standard, and float its currency, which uh, depreciated so greatly that Japan ran out of buying power. These terrible conditions and the large wealth gaps led to fighting between the left and the right. By 1932, there was a massive upsurge in right-wing nationalism and militarism in the hope that order and economic stability could be forcibly restored. Japan set up to get the natural resources and the human resources. It uh, needed by seizing them from other countries, invading Manchuria in 1931 and spreading out through uh, China and Asia. As with Germany, it could be argued that Japan's path of military aggression to get needed resources was more cost-effective than relying on classic trading and economic practices. In the years that followed, Japan's top-down fascist command economy grew stronger, building a military-industrial complex to protect its existing bases in East Asia and the Northern China and support its excursions into other countries. As was also the case in Germany, while most Japanese companies remained privately hold, their production was controlled by the government. What is a fascism? Consider the following three big choices that a country has to make when selecting its approach to governance. Number one, bottom-up, democratic or top-down autocratic decision-making. Second, capitalist or communist, with a socialist in the middle, ownership and production. And the third, individualist, which treats the well-being of the individual with paramount importance. Or collectivist, which treats the well-being of the whole with uh, paramount importance. Pick the one from each category that you believe is optimal for your nation's values and ambitions, and you have your preferred approach. The U.S. and the Allies. In the U.S., debt problems became ruinous for American banks after 1929, which curtailed their lending around the world, 
hurting international borrowers. Raising tariffs to protect the domestic businesses and the jobs during bad economic times is common, but it leads to reduced efficiency because、uh, production does not occur where it can be done most efficiently. Ultimately, tariffs contribute to greater global economic weakness, as、uh, tariffs wars cause the countries that impose them to lose exports. Tariffs do, however, benefit the entities that are protected by them, and they can create political support for the leaders who impose them. So, when things Worsened in 1930, and tariffs began. Bad conditions became desperate conditions in those countries. Harmful acts of nature, for example, droughts, floods, and plagues, often cause periods of great economic hardship. That, when combined with other adverse conditions, lead to periods of a great conflict. Deflationary depressions. A debt crisis caused by there not being enough money in the hands of debtors to service their debts, they inevitably lead to the printing of money, debt restructurings, and government spending programs that increase the supply of and reduce the value of money and credit. The only question is how long. It takes for government officials to make this move. In the case of the U.S., it took three and a half years from the crash in October 1929 until President Franklin D. Roosevelt's March 1933 actions. In Roosevelt's first 100 days in office, he created several massive government spending programs that were paid for. By big tax increases and big budget deficits, financed by debt that are Federal Reserve monetized. From 1933 until the end of 1936, the stock market turned over 200 percent, and the economy grew at a Blistering average real rate of about nine percent. In 1936, the Federal Reserve tightened the money and the credit to fight inflation and the slow,、uh, overheating economy, which caused the fragile U.S. economy to fall back into a recession and the other major economies to weaken with it, further raising tensions within and between countries. So at this time we are、uh, again at the same situation, probably as in 1936, as the Federal Reserve、uh, is talking about、uh, tightening money and credit to fight inflation. That、uh, could lead to something interesting. During periods of several economic distress and large wealth gaps, there are typically revolutionary large redistributions of wealth. When done peacefully, these are achieved through large tax increases on the rich and big increases in the supply of money that、uh, devalue debtors' claims. And when done violently. They are achieved by forced asset confiscations. Before there is a, a shooting war, there is usually a economic war. In addition to the economically motivated conflicts within countries and the political shifts that arose from them, all of these countries faced increased external economic conflicts as they fought for greater shares of a, a shrinking economic pie. Before going on to describe the hot war, I want to elaborate on the common tactics and when economic and capital tools are weaponized, they have been and still are. Number one, asset freezes 
seizures. Two, blocking capital markets access. Three, embargoes and blockades. Okay, the next section, the hot war begins. Um, there are a lot of uh, materials here. I don't want to uh, read it out. Uh, but there is a, a emphasized paragraph here. When countries are weak, opposing countries take advantage of their weakness to obtain gains. In war, one's ability to withstand pain is even more important than one's ability to inflict pain. Conclusion. Every world power has its time in the sun. Thanks to the uniqueness of their circumstances and the nature of their character and culture, but they all eventually decline. Some do so more gracefully than others, with less trauma, but they nevertheless decline. Traumatic declines can lead to some of the worst periods in history, when big fights over wealth, wealth and power prove extremely costly, both economically and in human lives. Still, the cycle needn't transpire this way if countries in their rich and the powerful stages stay productive, earn more than they spend, make the system work well for most of their populations, and figure out ways of creating and sustaining win-win relationships with their most significant rivals. Apparently, America at this time has uh, all kinds of uh, the problems that mentioned here, and uh, it seems that uh, we are not uh, doing everything we can to stay productive. The money given free may not be so effective. But anyway, um, that's where we are today. Okay, that's the end of this chapter. Um, it's uh, quite short, but uh, it is as uh, expected.